Hello, so we're continuing through our reading of The Ethics of Ambiguity. Uh, we'll finish up, I think, the first chapter, uh, which is on ambiguity and freedom today. Uh, and we've seen so far that Beauvoir has laid out the sort of basic theoretical framework. She's gotten some key ideas on the table, um, existentialist notions of failure, structure of consciousness, the importance of freedom. and. She's dealt with some issues uh, in Marxism, which we discussed in the last video. Uh, so this uh, ending really brings and ties a lot of things together. So I just want to go through that um, with you. The Marx discussion wrapped up around pages 22 and 23. Um, and she turns after uh, this discussion of doesn't dialectical materialism demand that meaning and value emerge more or less out of material conditions and not directly from the spontaneous free action of human beings. And so on the one hand, there's a tendency in Marxism to subsume the individual into the movement of history and allow history to determine um, the values available to the um, individual, where existentialism asserts that the individual in their freedom uh, must be the generator of values as they engage and commit themselves in the world. So she says on page 23, as for us, whatever the case may believe, we believe in freedom. It is true that this belief must lead us to despair. Must we grant this curious paradox that from the moment a man recognizes himself as free, he is prohibited from wishing, wishing for anything? On the contrary, it appears to us that by turning toward this freedom, we are going to discover a principle of action whose range will be universal. The characteristic feature of all ethics is to consider human life as a game that can be won or lost and to teach man the means of winning. Now, we have seen that the original scheme of man is ambiguous, he wants to be, and to the extent that he coincides with this wish, he fails. When we think of freedom, Beauvoir is beginning to sketch here with this assertion of the existentialist belief in freedom, the grounds by which she's going to justify freedom as an absolute value. And so the argument that she makes following from what I was just reading has to do with freedom as being the ground for all of our projects and commitments. We make ourselves a lack and we project some end that we strive for that we will fail to completely coincide with because that end will just be another beginning. Once that closes off, another um, opening will emerge for another project. The way that we commit ourselves to these projects and the ends that we will are determining in part the value, what is going to help and hinder me. We're disclosing the world as having certain signification within this project as it relates to my ends and what I'm trying to do and, and accomplish, the way I relate to other people and they relate back to me and so on. So values are, being, are, are emerging uh, from that. That's their ground in human history and in human interaction. We are stuck with having to choose. We have to choose within the, this context and within that situation. And all of these projects, everything that I just sort of ran through, hinges upon people being free. Freedom is the source from which all significations and all values spring. Because if I wasn't free in my spontaneous uprising into the world, I wouldn't be able to do all the other stuff that's involved with projecting ends and seeking it and so on and so forth. And because I freely project that end, the values that then arise relative to my project and my situation amongst other people ultimately find their source in freedom, because freedom is the enabling factor here, right? It's the source of all that. Freedom is the source from which all significations and all values spring. It is the original condition of all justification of existence. The man who seeks to justify his life must want freedom itself absolutely and above everything else at the same time that it requires the realization of concrete ends of particular projects, it requires itself universally. Uh, again, because uh, freedom is the very condition of possibility for those projects. 
Um, and so if you desire a project or an end, you, need, you must desire freedom implicitly because you need the freedom to pursue that end. A lot of the, when other people appear to you as a hindrance, one of the primary things they're doing is frustrating your free attempts. You're trying to do something and they're keeping you from doing it. And so they are a hindrance to you. Now, that's how they're disclosed. Remember, disclosure is very important, and so they appear as something that can stop you. They appear as a freedom enacting on yours. Here is, I think, one of the first and very clear instances in the text of Beauvoir making the case that freedom presents itself as an absolute value. Why? Because it's the ground of all projects, and it's the very condition of possibility for any striving or activity toward anything, right? Now, she considers immediately um, an objection. What meaning can there be in the words to will oneself free since at the beginning we are free? It is contradictory to set freedom up as something conquered if at first something is given. Now, here's the catch. Here's where Beauvoir, I think, really distinguishes the existentialist tradition from discussions of the freedom of the will. Beauvoir rejects freedom as a kind of quality or property of a thing. She immediately says in response to this um, objection, this objection would mean something only if freedom were a thing or a quality naturally attached to a thing. Then, in effect, one would either have it or not have it. But the fact is that it emerges with the very movement of this ambiguous reality which is called existence and which it is only by making itself be to such an extent that it's precisely only by having to be conquered that it gives itself. To will oneself free is to effect the transition from nature to morality by establishing a genuine freedom on the original upsurge of our existence. So normally when we discuss free will in philosophical context, you talk about the will that a person has, like the command center that I make, the, the will makes certain decisions and it guides my actions. And then this will has a further property, freedom. And there are certain conditions that are necessary for the will to, for this property to obtain in the will. And the conflict between freedom of the will and determinism is framed around this issue. You know, can the will have this property of freedom given the deterministic nature of the universe and so on and so forth. Beauvoir does not think that freedom is a property that can be ascribed to anything. Uh, it's not that you come into existence and then you have this property of freedom. Freedom is like the very ground of your existence. You are free in a thorough sense. With It's not as if it's some property of you. So when you will yourself free, you're embracing this ontological fact of your existence and you're taking on the kind of responsibility that comes with your freedom, right? You're owning up to the reality of your situation and the demands it places upon you to make a choice. Uh, you must choose, right? Every man is originally free in the sense that he spontaneously casts himself into the world, but if we consider the spontaneity and its facticity, it appears to us only as a pure contingency, an upsurging as stupid as the clinamen of the Epicurean atom which turned up at any moment whatsoever from any direction whatsoever. The Epicureans had a theory of the atom uh, what she's referring to there is sometimes in English re referred to as the swerve. There's a pretty good uh, book about this uh, that came out. I think it's just called the swerve. It's up there. Um, yeah, it's just called the swerve, I think, by uh, Greenblatt. But anyway, the atom, the motion of the atom just was subject to a random, you know, it just kind of, and it was random. It, you, there was no predicting it. Um, it the atom was, had its motion and it just had the swerve in it. Um, again, that's viewing things far too free theoretically from uh, Beauvoir. Yeah, okay, from the outside sometimes it looks like the human will is random and so on and so forth. No. The actual lived experience of being free as a being for itself that has projects and so on there's an order and reasonableness to it. There's reasons why you're doing things, and there are certain motivations. It's, it never appears merely as this like random thing, it, because it's embedded in a situation and in a certain context from which it derives meaning and how it accesses the world and it, in which it realizes its projects and so on and so forth, right? I mean, 
it's not just out there in the void uh, spinning its wheels, right? So that's an absurd um, way to think about it. We have to think about the concrete um, context in which it is. Um, she introduces here an important problem of the one who chooses not to will themselves free. As she gives you a couple of um, in laziness, heedlessness, capriciousness, cowardice, impatience, one contests the meaning of the project at the very moment that one defines it. The spontaneity of the subject is in merely a vain living palpitation. Its movement toward the object of flight in itself is an absence. Um, so when you're doing this, you are engaged in some sort of a project when you're being capricious or whatever, you know, that list that she just gave us. But you're already drawing it into question, like, at every turn. You're engaged in it, but you're not sort of, you're not authentically engaged in it. It's always like, nah, I'll do this, but I don't want to, or I don't really, uh, I'm not embracing it. Um, there's something about it that I'm doing sort of against my own will or something like that uh, to think of. So what I have to do is be able to uh, choose it willingly. I must assume my project positively. Um, she says, my project is never founded, it founds itself. To avoid the anguish of this permanent choice, one may attempt to flee into the object itself to engulf one's own presence in it. In the servitude of the serious, the original spontaneity strives to deny itself. So this is going to feature very prominently in the next chapter. She's going to sketch a few sorts of uh, psychological profiles, some avoidance strategies, and seriousness, or the serious one, is a very important one and a very significant one in my mind. I think that this is a, a really useful concept for doing sort of uh, cultural, political uh, criticism. So keep that in mind. Just sort of flag that the servitude of the serious. You know, this is a type. And seriousness will be a psychological strategy or a strategy that we use to avoid our freedom and to flee from it to have a negative relationship with our project and engagement insofar as we don't want to own up to it as ours and take the responsibility for justifying it sort of uh, in the world. So here we can see we're not just the random swerve. We have our reasons, we have our justifications, but we can't expect them to come from outside of us. We have to do the justifying. We have to stand and say, here's why I'm doing it. Because we're the only person that can provide those reasons. Because we're the one doing it. Why, who else is going to tell me what I, why I'm doing what I'm doing? I can sort of trick myself and lie to myself. I might not always be fully aware of exactly every little in and out of why I'm doing what I'm doing. But upon any sort of critical reflection, I should be able to sketch for you um, a more or less acceptable picture of sort of why I'm doing what I'm doing. You might not like it. And I might not like your justification, but there's what it is. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Take it or leave it, uh, I guess. Now, again, we can enter into a negotiation, and we can try to persuade one another and win one, one, an win one another over to each other's projects and so on and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but in that case, our projects would be changing and our engagements would be shifting and we would come into different reasons then for doing the things that we're doing. Um, so it's really important to keep this sort of fluid. There's nothing like that's fixed about it. And again, that I would hold as if it's like a property of me that you could fix um, in a certain way. It is all fluid relative to my engagements and projects, which can change and can legitimately change. Um, there can be good reason for it. There's a very significant, I think, passage that comes up after this, because we've been talking a lot about how um, projects generate values and meaning and significance. And of course, one of the constant refrains against existentialism and against postmodern philosophy and all kinds of stuff is that oh, all these people just think this stuff is social constructs and therefore it's not real. Or they think they just create the world willy-nilly that I think something and I create something um, by my thought, by naming it or something like that. Um, no. Uh, Beauvoir very clearly says, um, we're talking about, yes, of course, 
my projects and my engagement with the world generate values, it creates meaning and significance, and it discloses being. It discloses the world to be in a certain way relative to my meaningful engagement with it. However, she says, man does not create the world. He succeeds in disclosing it only through the resistance which the world opposes to him. The will is defined only by raising obstacles and by the contingency of facticity, certain obstacles let themselves be conquered and others do not. In the face of an obstacle which it is impossible to overcome, stubbornness is stupid. If I persist in beating my fist against the stone wall, my freedom exhausts itself in this useless gesture without succeeding in giving itself a content. It debases itself in a vain contingency. So the things that are being disclosed are there, and they resist us. We experience the recalcitrance of the world. We, it doesn't just bend itself immediately to our will. But how that object is revealed depends upon what it is I'm trying to do. For one person who has certain abilities, a rock in the path might not be an obstacle. It might be an, an exciting opportunity for a climb. For someone who is, has different capabilities, the rock is an obstacle. For some people, a set of stairs is a means of access. And for other people, it is an obstacle, if you're in a wheelchair or something like that. Um, and something else presents a better opportunity. Uh, for if, you, if, you're, if there's a steep incline and, and a person who's in a wheelchair has to go up the incline, it's much easier for them sometimes to go up a gradual sort of snake path up the steep incline. Any vehicle uh, with wheels, like uh, for a person walking, it might take that that might take too long, right? Um, it seems sort of weird to walk back and forth and back and forth and back and forth when you could walk up the hill, exerting a different kind of energy. Uh, but that's just the way that opportunities present themselves differently to people who are engaged in different projects and who are related to the world in different ways. Both of those objects are there. Um, they and we both share encounters with them and we can both talk about this object that appears but the significance of the object is determined in part by what I'm trying to do and the abilities that it affords me uh, in the world right so this is I think really important and I'm going to probably stress this point again and again and again uh, Satra also discusses this, you know, issue in, at length in various places uh, throughout being in nothingness and so on, right? The truth is, Beauvoir says, in order for my freedom not to risk coming to grief against the obstacle which, it is, which it, its very engagement has raised, in order that it might still pursue its movement in the face of the failure, it must, by giving itself a particular content, aim by means of it at the end, which is nothing else but precisely the free movement of existence. Uh, my freedom must not seek to trap being, but to disclose it. The disclosure is the transition from being to existence. The, the goal which my freedom aims at is conquering existence across the always inadequate density of being. Um, so a lot of it depends upon my orientation and my attitude taken in the world about how I'm able to see things as opportunities in order to continue on and keep working at my project. Uh, if I face an obstacle, unless I'm just going to resign to it and just give up and throw my hands up, I have to try and find another way or another disclosure that is an opportunity instead of an obstacle. I have to for to look for ways around and try to open up opportunities as best as I can. Uh, now, of course, it's easier and harder in certain situations to do this. This is the source of a lot of disadvantage in the world. But people, unless they totally give up, are going to try to find workarounds. And they're going to do different things in order to try to realize their projects. Um, Again, we might not always like the choices that they make or approve of them, uh, but short of simply just giving up and everyone's always going to be working toward achieving their, their goals. I mean, some people will give up or become despondent and we have all kinds of mental health issues as a result of 
society being so organized that people have a harder time than need be uh, realizing their projects and goals and stuff but uh, uh, people don't just mass resign themselves I mean we have a lot of struggle um, for something better right and I think that what Beauval is talking about here speaks to that in a in a way that uh, sheds, sheds, sheds a lot of light on it um, and gives us a good insight into the human condition and uh, all of that. Uh, so one of the reasons I keep returning to this book um, again and again. She closes this chapter uh, talking about freedom and the role that it plays in meaning making. And she clarifies some about human transcendence, right? It seeks with the destruction of the given situation, the whole future which will flow from its victory. When I want to change something or act on a project, I'm changing the world and I'm disclosing the world differently, which means destroying one situation so that something new can step into its place, right? And opening up different possibilities. If I want to overcome an obstacle, there's a sense in which I want to see that obstacle destroyed so that the potential and opportunities on the other side of that destruction can be realized. Again, there are these basic ambiguities that Beauvoir is going to continue to play on that destruction and creation also, the end of one thing is the beginning of another. Again, back to that project. As long as I am transcending myself into the future and towards some object uh, that I hope to realize, that is gonna come into play. I'm going to be involved in this play of negation, positing something, moving beyond it, and so on. And so inherent within destruction is creation and creation destruction and so on. Another ambiguity. Um, to sort of mark. Now, this has been a pretty strong endorsement of willing yourself free, that if freedom is sort of a fact of our existence, and we must reconcile ourselves to the necessity of having to choose, then ethically we should embrace this freedom, since we cannot flee it. Even fleeing it is to freely fre flee, right? Um, so we should work on em embracing it. But that raises the question. If man has one and only one way to save his existence by willing himself free and, and embracing that freedom, how can he choose not to choose it in all cases? How is a bad willing possible? And of course, this is a general problem with ethics. This is the problem of evil. This is the problem of... You know, all, just how is a bad willing possible? There's always, again, the problem of, well, it's by missing the mark of the transcendental good, of, of the absolute value that exists outside of us. Um, but if one grants that the moral world is the world genuinely willed by man, all possibility of error is eliminated. So it, that within existentialism, that can't be the answer. It can't be because we tried to will the good, which is something external to humanity, and we failed. No, the good emerges out of the very willing of human beings. So, okay, that we, that can't be it. The problem, though, uh, that we see is that if you take someone like Kant, the human will there is a purely positive thing. It's a purely uh, positive willing. That's how she understands Kant. Um, and so it's harder to explain how that um, autonomous will could be evil because it stems from rationality if rationality is the ground of the rules then goodness resides in rationality and if our will flows directly from rationality how can the will be bad because the rationality is good it's the seed of all rules that we should follow so how can the a will that stems from a purely rational position uh, ever become corrupted it seems to be difficult in Kant well the will isn't wholly positive in existentialism on the contrary, humanity is defined as negativity, as nothingness. Um, that emergence of that negativity in the world, of the nothingness in the world. He is first at a distance. He can coincide with himself only by agreeing never to rejoin himself, by residing in that ambiguity and by owning the, that distance and taking up our freedom and our projects, by not trying to collapse into one side or the other. Remember, she wants to hold ambiguity um, in place. Therefore, not only do we assert that the existentialist doctrine permits the elaboration of an ethics, but it even appears to us as the only philosophy in which an ethics has its place. 
For in a metaphysics of transcendence, in the classical sense of the term, evil is reduced to error, and in humanistic philosophies it is impossible to account for it, man being defined as complete in a complete world. Existentialism alone gives a real role to evil, and it is perhaps which makes its judgment so gloomy. Men do not like to feel themselves in danger. It is because there are real dangers, real fails, and real earthly damnation that words like victory, wisdom, or joy have meaning. So again, it's by our very condition uh, that we are bound to these choices that we make. Nothing can save us from them or alleviate those choices. They take on an absolute quality. And so existentialism appears gloomy, Beauvoir thinks, because it places us in real danger. Like we could really screw up and we can't just go to church and like ask for forgiveness about it and not be a screw up anymore. No, that takes on the condition of a facticity as it sinks into the past and we always have to do that and we will always have to act in the face of having done the thing we regret or whatever the case may be. So existentialism puts us in a real danger um, because we could fail miserably and have to own that failure absolutely. Now again, this is why bad faith is such a big thing because people, that's very anguishing and distressing. It causes people a lot of anxiety and they would really like to flee from this responsibility. Um, it's understandable. I mean, I think one of the things that is so powerful about the analysis of bad faith that's gonna be carried out in the next chapter is because it has a pretty strong explanatory power for why people act the way that they do, um, because they're afraid of their freedom for a, of their freedom for a large part of their life. Um, she paints these really poignant philosophical psychological por portraits that I think have a lot of explanatory power, and that I can see in people around me all the time doing things in my own self all all the time. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I just think it explains a lot and, and does a good job of fleshing out sort of from the first personal why people do the things they do. Not from the theoretical like, oh, because they're determined by biology and they're, they have evolutionary whatever. No, but from like the real lived, like this is the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing kind of position uh, where we can have like a real relationship of respect with someone else and not view them merely as a theoretical object in the... Uh, from the scientific perspective or whatever. But why do people say and explain themselves in the ways that they do? Um, what kinds of first personal explanations do we have? I think we're going to see a lot um, of good resources in the next chapter for that. So uh, that is the end of the first chapter on ambiguity and freedom. Um, she ends with uh, how we will be sliding between attitudes of authenticity and bad faith and that's going to take up a lot of the next chapter and uh, we'll keep moving ahead uh, i'm really looking forward to the rest of this uh, text and uh, thanks for hanging in there with me